Okay, Sergeant Biondo, you may start your opening. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committee on Housing and Buildings. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video? Once again, could all panelists please turn on their video? To minimize disruptions, please place all electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimonies at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at, at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you so much. I want to gavel us in. Good afternoon, I'm Council Member Robert Cornegy, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. Today, the committee will be hearing a bill related to extending the full compliance date of existing site safety training requirements. Pursuant to Local Law 196 of 2017, construction workers are required to complete specific hours of site safety training courses. The deadline to complete these courses was initially May 1st, 2019. However, due to delays in curriculum development and insufficient course provider capacity, the full compliance date was extended to September 1st, 2020 by Local Law 119 of 2019. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 crisis has impacted the ability of construction workers to complete the training requirements, with in-person courses becoming unavailable and a limited number of course providers able to conduct trainings remotely Many construction workers may be unable to complete the training requirements by September 1st. The proposed intro sponsored by the public advocate, Council Member Menchaca, and myself will provide more time by extending the full compliance date to March 1st, 2021. We expect to hear testimony from the Department of Buildings as well as interested members of the public. I'd like to thank my, my fellow committee members present today. Uh, who do we have? Council Member Margaret Chin. Council Member Barry Gudenchik, um, Council Member obviously Carlos Menchaca, who is the sponsor of the prime sponsor of this bill. Council Member, I saw Mark Jonai. Uh, I believe that's it for, for, for now. Um, we are now going to. have an opening from the, the bill sponsor, uh, Council Member Carlos Menchaca. Can we, un, can we unmute Carlos? No, unmute it. I think, we're, I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's been a while since we've spoken. So good that we're, we're talking here um, about a very important issue. And uh, I also want to give a shout out to public advocate uh, Jumani Williams, uh, who's been a fierce advocate along my side in this work. You know, when the, pand the pandemic started, I joined others in calling on the governor to halt inessential construction to protect the health of workers who were putting themselves and their families at risk at the height of the pandemic. Uh, this is before we had adequate PPE to give to all essential workers and testing was still barely off the ground. It made no sense under those circumstances to put people in harm's way so that developers could build luxury condos and office space when no one was going to live in them or work in them anytime soon. To his credit, the governor listened and the halt was made. But this, is, this also meant that the day laborers and the union workers and contractors were either unable or rightly cautious about getting site safety training. Since construction returned after we began reopening with proper PPE distribution and testing, the public advocate and I have heard from both unions and the day labor organizations that an extension of the site safety training requirements is needed so that everyone can stay safe and employed. These essential workers deserve every chance to get trained for their safety and for our collective safety in our communities as we recover. So no one could have foreseen this pandemic or the halt to the construction uh, it necessitated, necessitated, but we cannot penalize workers for that, especially when they are engaged in the hardest and arguably the most essential work right now as we recover economically from COVID-19. So I urge all my colleagues to consider these special circumstances that affect the construction industry. And keep in mind that many construction workers are immigrant New Yorkers with nearly half of all immigrants 
unemployed because of this pandemic and we cannot uh, consign more of them to insecurity. So I wanna say thank you to the chair uh, and to all the members on this committee. Uh, I wanna take this opportunity before we move on to acknowledge the presence of both council member for Fernando Cabrera and Bill Perkins representing Harlem. Um, I'm now gonna turn it over to our committee council to go over some procedural items. Thanks, Chair Carnegie. I'm Austin Branford, Counselor to the City Council's Committee on Housing and Buildings. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you'll be unmuted by one of our staff. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called, as I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. We will first be hearing testimony from the administration, followed by members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to three minutes, including responses. We will now turn to testimony from the administration. Today, we'll be hearing from Commissioner Luaka of the Department of Buildings. I will now administer the oath. Commissioner, please raise your right hand. You affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Great. You can begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Carnegie and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. I'm Melanie LaRocca, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Buildings. I'm pleased to be here to discuss the important issue of construction safety. Keeping our construction sites safe and protecting the public is a top priority for the department. While construction safety continues to be a focus of the department, we're only as good as the industry we regulate. Building owners, contractors, and the construction workforce must do their part in ensuring a climate of safety exists on, uh, at the city's nearly 45,000 active construction sites. I commend construction sites where safety is prioritized and where the laws and regulations that govern construction, including site safety training requirements established by the city through Local Law 196 of 2017 are followed. This historic law requires workers at larger construction sites receive site safety training. The department is committed to holding construction in the construction industry accountable, a goal that we've accomplished by conducting regular proactive inspections at construction sites to identify safety lapses and to ensure that workers are being appropriately trained. I'm happy to report that for the first time in nearly a decade, construction related injuries decreased over 20% last year compared to the previous year. This is a trend that we're committed to seeing continue. Every worker must go home to their families at the end of their shift and the work they engage in must be safe, not just for their benefit, but for the benefit of every member of the public. This decrease in injuries comes after the launch of our construction safety compliance unit which is dedicated to conducting proactive inspections of our larger construction sites. To date, CSC has conducted over 45,000 proactive inspections at nearly, uh, nearly 19,000 unique construction sites, issuing 20,000 violations and over 4,000 stop work orders. Our goal at the department is to continue to improve construction safety, and we recognize that site safety training is key to achieving that goal. The decrease in injuries we saw last year can be attributed to our proactive inspections, which include our enforcement of Local Law 196. Currently, workers at many construction sites are required to have 30 hours of safety training and supervisors at those sites are required to have 62 hours of safety training. When fully phased in, Local Law 196 will require workers have 40 hours of safety training. This department will continue to monitor the effectiveness of this law and looks forward to working with this committee to identify opportunities to further improve upon it. Since the enactment of this law, we have conducted extensive outreach to the construction industry, including visiting construction sites to connect directly with the workers who are impacted. We ran an educational advertising campaign that included television, radio, and subway ads. We also released our site safety construction map, which is an interactive map that workers can use to determine whether a construction site requires site safety training. We will also be hosting a virtual worker safety event next month, which will highlight Local Law 196 and the importance of receiving site safety training. 
To date, our approved course providers have issued nearly 90,000 site safety training cards and many thousands of OSHA 30 cards to workers, which means that workers are receiving the site safety training required by this law. We are pleased with the compliance that we're seeing on the ground. To date, our inspectors have identified 900 construction sites where approximately 1,500 workers did not have their required training. This resulted in the issuance of approximately 3,000 violations to owners, contractors, and employers, uh, for which over 2 million in penalties has already been collected. The legislation before the committee today would extend the date by which construction and demolition workers must complete their 40 hours of training. For many workers who are seeking to satisfy their training requirement, the remaining 10 hours of training includes eight hours of fall prevention. This training is critical to improving site safety as many construction related injuries and fatalities in recent years have involved worker falls. Last year alone, worker falls accounted for 50% of construction related fatalities and nearly 25% of injuries. While the department has concerns about extending the deadline for workers to complete their training, we understand that COVID-19 has had an impact on many aspects of our lives, including delaying workers from receiving their training. Due to COVID-19, many of our approved course providers began offering site safety training online. We have nearly, uh, we now have nearly 100 course providers offering site, site safety training in multiple languages, 49 of which are now offering training online in a format that complies with Local Law 196. Our online course provider map, which is sortable, of course, uh, by language or uh, offering, as well as the type of course and now online training availability, uh, allows workers to find out exactly where training is available that they need. We have no objections to this extension, but I urge our construction workforce not to delay this potentially life-saving training. The sooner this training is completed, the better for both workers and the public. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today, and I certainly welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Commissioner. We'll now turn to any questions from Chair Cornegy. Uh, yes, before I ask my questions, I do want to acknowledge the presence of uh, Council Member Farrah Lewis, Council Member Helen Rosenthal, and if I didn't mention before, Council Member Margaret Chen. Uh, hey, Commissioner, how are you? I'm well, thank you, Council Member. How are you? So I know that we've had a couple of uh, accidents on sites, and I want to thank you for your prompt response to those and for connecting with my office to give us updates on what was happening. I really appreciate that kind of dialogue. It helps the city run smoother. Thank God there were no fatalities. Uh, and so it's, 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 it's amazing that we're at this again to make sure that we can prevent that. I mean, in a city that's building exponentially, we have to be diligent on making sure that there is, uh, that the protocols are in place for safety. So I appreciate working with your office to make sure that that's, um, that's a part of it. I want to thank uh, the other co-sponsors, Carlos Menchaca for this great bill, as well as public advocate, Jamani Williams. My first question is, what is the current rate of compliance with the site safety training requirements established by local law 196 of 2017? Thank you, uh, Chair, for that question, and thank you for those very kind words. We appreciate the partnership we have immensely. Um, the compliance to date has been very strong uh, from what we're seeing. As I mentioned, our Construction Safety Compliance Unit um, is primarily the unit tasked with uh, ensuring there is compliance, but we do have every one of our units that walks onto a site also participating in, in, in checking to see that there's compliance. To date, we found uh, 919 sites uh, and uh, 1,506 workers on those sites where there were uh, was not uh, the required training. So that is of the nearly 19,000 unique sites that Construction Safety Compliance has visited uh, is since their inception. That's about a 95% uh, rate of compliance, which is uh, very, very strong. Uh, how many construction workers uh, still need, I'm sorry, the date, how many construction workers have completed the site safety training requirements? Do we know that number? So uh, we are uh, aware of our providers of which there are nearly a hundred. 
have issued uh, about 88,500 site safety training cards to workers. Um, we know that uh, the Department of the State Department of Labor estimates about 150,000 workers, which includes individuals who do not. Uh, I want to emphasize this: who do not engage in uh, construction activities on site. We also know the universe for required uh, where training is required uh, is about 6,500 sites at this point. So again, the issuance of the site safety training cards is very high. Uh, as well as when you look at even at the supervisory level, those who have achieved uh, supervisory uh, training, which is the 62 hours is very high. Um, uh, so we're seeing, I think, broadly speaking, that plus the OSHA 30s that are administered both by our providers as well as other OSHA approved providers um, has been very high. So, so some of us, especially as sponsors, uh, believe that this bill is incredibly important. The reason I asked for that number because I really basically wanted to see between how many people who've actually received it, how many people are, are you know, how many people have not received it. Uh, so we could gauge the importance of the bill. It's hard to do that without having having those numbers, obviously. I mean, I think you know, generally, uh, like you said, that there's a, a large number, but getting that number and then understanding the number that's still outstanding kind of helps us understand the importance of extending this and but not continuing to extend it in perpetuity so uh if at some point you could get those numbers to this committee it would be greatly appreciated absolutely in an effort to make sure that we're not just playing the extension extension game and that there really is an end site, um, and that we can at some point begin to feel safer as a city due to compliance agree and we'll be uh we'll be sure to get to the committee today the numbers one of the questions has what has been and is now, are there enough course providers? We initially uh, extended it because of the amount of course providers and those kinds of things. So are there enough course providers to accommodate all the remaining construction workers? Now, I know we don't know that number, but are there enough, in your estimation, are there enough course providers qualified to administer the site safety training? We believe there are. At this point to date, we have 98 course providers uh, that are offering site safety training. And again, we're providing workers and members of the public exactly who those providers are, what courses they offer, what languages they offer it in, and whether they have online capabilities or not. So we believe at this point there is sufficient capacity. Um, so this pandemic has changed the way that we do business. We're actually on a Zoom call, which no one would have ever thought six months ago we'd be conducting hearings of the New York City Council and advocating for bills such as this uh, remotely. Um, so it's, it's a great concern of how many course providers are currently able to conduct trainings remotely. Yeah, we um, certainly, uh, it's an understatement of our lifetime to say that uh, nobody could have uh, planned for this pandemic. Uh, uh, certainly I, I didn't never see it coming. So, uh, but I will say, Local Law 196, when passed, did allow for providers to offer online uh, training. Uh, if you look back in history, uh, at the beginning of April of just this year, we had one provider um, offering online uh, courses. Um, to date, we have 49 providers, so 49 of the, of the 98. So again, in the vein of capacity, we understand you know, we had to do it at the department, transition our, our services, our business model from a very much in-person, very much in paper uh, to very much online, not in person. Um, and we've seen that as well in our providers. Um, so we're, we're very confident at the number uh, that are offering those courses right now. So I'm very proud, obviously, of the New York City Council having, being able to pivot and shift and not stopping the business of this city by being hampered, not being able to operate remotely. So that's a big shout out to everybody who's uh, at the back end of this, making sure that these hearings can happen effectively and efficiently. Um, what percentage would you say does that 49 provider, what percentage of that 49 provider number make up of the overall number of providers? Sure, it's about half. So we have 49 right now that are providing some online uh, courses. Um, 
And at, uh, to date, we have 98 um, total providers who are eligible to offer the courses in person or otherwise. So it's about half. So are we encouraging those other uh, providers, the other half of the providers, to move to an online uh, model or a hybrid model to meet the needs of this site safety training compliance? Certainly, and there's never been a, uh, during the pandemic, there's never been a moment where the department has, has hesitated. Um, if we've heard from providers who have questions or concerns uh, on whether they can go uh, online. Thank you. I want to acknowledge before my last question, the presence of uh, Council Member Carlina Rivera. Um, you know, obviously the devil's always in the details in our business, right? And by that, I mean um, compliance uh, uh, as well as uh, the ability to audit. How is the Department of Buildings conducting audits of online course providers in particular? Yeah, so we have a, a group of individuals who um, uh, are set out with and tasked with ensuring that we audit the course providers themselves, the organization, as well as the individual courses that are being provided. So pre-COVID, we were doing that obviously a little different. We were doing that in person. We had our investigators attend the classes to ensure that the quality of the uh, course was as specified. And uh, uh, on the back end, on the office side, that the paperwork um, all made sense. We're still doing that. Um, the providers have very specific requirements about what type of online uh, course they're allowed to do. Um, so they can't do a PowerPoint where you, you, know, you can't have a live in-person proctoring. Um, so we are able to audit those as well to ensure that it is uh, meeting the specifications of the law. So I have a few more questions, but I wanna make sure that my colleagues get a, an opportunity to ask their questions. I'm gonna turn it back over to Austin. So we sure. can get the process of going through the stack of uh, our colleagues. I'm sure that Carlos from Chaka have some questions. We probably would be first. So, sure, I'll, I'll now call on council members to ask questions in the order that they use the Zoom raise hand function. So council members, please keep your questions to three minutes, including responses. If there is a second round of questioning, council member questions will be limited to two minutes. The Sergeant in Arms will keep a timer and let you know when your time is up. So we'll start with Council Member Chin, followed by Council Member Manchaka. Mr. Chin. Your time will begin now. Thank you. Hi, Commissioners. Great to see you. Uh, you. I just want some clarification. When you were uh, talking about the number of hours uh, for the training for workers, um, so is it 30 hours or 40 hours? So currently, the requirement is for 30 hours. That day passed. Uh, on December 1st, that uh, was the date where that requirement went into effect. The requirement for the additional 10 hours um, is coming up on uh, September 1st. And so we are talking about that Delta period of those additional 10 hours. So the additional 10 hour is for all the construction workers. So, it's so that's a huge number. It's an that's additional a huge number. 10 hours for workers who are working on a site as specified by the law. So broadly speaking, um, any site that requires a construction super, a site safety coordinator, or a site safety manager. So again, very broadly, think of a four-story building or above, an enlargement to an existing building. We're not talking about one, two, three family homes. So that today, is about 6,500 sites across the city where this requirement is in place. So it is specific to the site. And so how many workers have been trained for that extra 10 hours? Do you have those statistics? So uh, we, have, we do know that to date, our providers have issued about 88,500 site safety cards. And that runs the gamut that were, um, of the cards that were issued include uh, outside of that number. And again, uh, because we are operating under the 30 hour requirement right now. So outside of that 88,500 is, you know, tens of thousands of OSHA 30 cards that were issued by our providers who may also be OSHA authorized or separately by just an OSHA approved provider. 
Yeah, I think it'll be it'll be good if you can provide uh, the breakdown statistic uh, to the committee so that we can better understand, the, you know, um, in terms of the needs. And my last question is that: Do you have a break? Can we have a breakdown on in terms of the language um, of the uh, of the workers that got the certificate? You know, like how many took the course in Spanish? How many took the course in Chinese? How many took the course in English? I think that that will also uh, be helpful. Certainly, I, I don't have the number, the breakdown of uh, courses that were taken uh, in the respective languages, but we do ensure that our providers are offering uh, courses in multiple languages. Uh, and across the board, we have 11 languages where courses are provided in. So yeah, maybe the provider can give us sure. uh, can give you the information. I think it'll be good for us to really see Time is up. in terms of what the language needs are. Happily, yes. Great, thank you. You're welcome. We will now hear from Councilmember Manchaka. Hi, Commissioner LaRocca, good, good to see you. Hi, Council Member. And um, I also just wanna say thank you for your leadership uh, in, in, in this role and working with you is gonna be just not only important, but I think um, critical in times of COVID and what the changes that are happening, hence the, the bill that we're, we're listening to today. And I guess the, my, my questions are really about the relationship with, with you and the, the day laborers. And if there's anything that you can tell us a little bit about, about how as COVID has, has um, impacted our, our city, but also but specifically in construction, um, what has you and your, uh, your office done to really, really reach out uh, and get a better sense about what's happening? Any report backs about what that looks like? Uh, any meetings? I wanna get a sense of, of flavor. And, and really the second piece is how can we work together as uh, post this law passing uh, to ensure that we get to the goals that you just stated in your opening uh, statement. Thank you, Council Member, for those. So very important uh, part of our universe here at the Department of Buildings is obviously working with organizations that represent day laborers. That is 100% a very large constituency of ours. And we do believe at the Department of Buildings that our constituency includes workers, period. Um, so they make up a very important constituent base for us. Uh, very early on, uh, when I took over at the Department of Buildings, I did meet with a number of organizations that represent day laborers, a very good conversation. I feel like we took away some very good homework that the department could be doing. Incidentally, uh, we did have a conversation, um, I wanna say about a week or so ago with uh, a group, again, representing day laborers on how to advance some of the goals that they had that we share. So some of those goals are, and we have to admittedly, we must do more of this, um, is getting our staff into the field in a non-punitive way, in a educational way. So we did that uh, last year around cold form steel. If you remember, there was an incident in the Bronx where we unfortunately had a fatality uh, and that site was employing yeah. cold form steel. Um, we felt it very important at that time and we continue to feel uh, uh, very strongly about this that we have to get directly to the worker. Um, and we have to do that because we need to arm them with information. If we believe, and I think this is a true statement, that the Department of Buildings is the definitive source when it comes to uh, how to build correctly and safely, then we have to do that directly to workers. So you saw, um, uh, you saw in response to that, DOB staff going into the field, we had produced information in multiple languages to hand out to workers on what to be aware of. Again, this is not punitive, not about the worker individually, more about making sure that they have awareness uh, when they walk on a site of things that could be potentially harmful to them. In this particular Thumbs case, up. it was cold form steel. So we have to do more of that, 100%, and you'll see more of that. Um, we are working later, excuse me, next month, not later, next month, um, as part of a series that we do annually. This year is the first year where we're gonna do events focused exclusively on workers. Mm -hmm. Meaning I don't want the audience to be architects and engineers, you know, we're not gonna turn anybody away, but the purpose is to make sure that we have workers. So to your second question, 
what I think would be helpful and I will make my staff available any time of the day, I will make myself available any time of the day, any day of the week, um, is to organize workers. Um, I want to do more workers, less train the trainers mm. um, and making sure my staff, uh, my experts can talk directly to workers about what to look out for, what they see and important, how to stay safe. Right. If your boss on a job site is telling you to do something, don't. Yeah. You know, if it's if it's one of these things, don't do that. You call the department right away. There's no fear in that. Right. It's an anonymous call, three one one, and we come out immediately. We need to break down those barriers. So I think the biggest ask that I would have is help make sure that those connections can happen. Um, because again, I will make my staff available to do as many meetings as often on a, re, a reoccurring um, uh, basis um, to make sure we're talking directly to the workers who I believe strongly need somebody to be their voice. Yeah. Um, and we believe very much in a culture of safety. We believe it's our job um, to be both the stick and the carrot in, in making sure that workers who uh, uh, walk onto a site go home safely to their family. Um, so we are ready, willing, and able. Thank you, Commissioner. I, my time is up, but I just want to say thank you for that commitment uh, that you gave the second you became the commissioner. And I think day labor organizations are, are listening to us now, and I want to make sure that we follow up and, and take you up on that, and you've already done that. So let's keep making that culture of safety real in every corner, no matter immigration, immigration status. When we think about census, COVID testing, all the things that are are, I think, um, presented to us right now as a city, this is one place that we have to get it right to, and that's about trust. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. We'll now turn back to Chair Carnegie for any final questions before turning to public testimony. Chair Carnegie? No, I've, I've asked my questions. Thank you, Commissioner, uh, for being frank and uh, following the protocols. Thank you, everybody who's had questions. Um, I'm good, thank you. Great. Thank you, Chair. So we'll now turn to testimony from members of the public. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our in-person council hearings, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute, unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and announce that you may begin. Your testimony will be limited to two minutes. We will first be hearing from Action OSH Co-op followed by Alba Villa. Your time will begin now. Hi, can everybody hear me? Hi, great. Thank you all so much for having me today. I wanna to say thank you to the committee and all the council members here. Some of who uh, I have known and, and been working alongside through different positions uh, through the worker cooperative world, as well as the day labor organizing world. Um, and I wanna give a thank you to Urban Upbound who invited us today to meet us here on the call with us as well. And then all the worker centers, uh, NICE and Workers Justice Project, seeing NICOSH here, other cooperatives as well. Um, ultimately, um, you know, we'll submit our written testimony, but we wanted to come and, and voice our concerns here today with the deadline as it stands. Um, our co-op, we are a worker cooperative, immigrant worker owned cooperative dedicated to health and safety training. We're OSHA trainers. We collaborate with service providers to provide the SST training as well. Um, since the rollout of uh, the local law, 196 in 2018, we've conducted thousands of hours of OSHA 30 training and SST 10 hour trainings, which amount to tens of thousands of contact hours with New York City construction workers. And, you know, as difficult as it is to name the specific number of workers we're referring to here when we're talking about how many people need trainings, it's understanding that we're talking about, you know, tens of millions of contact hours that need to get done in order to achieve 40 plus hours for every single construction worker that this applies to in New York City. Um, to be able to do that also means access. So a lot of the communities, we, we provide our own trainings. We work with private service providers to support their training programs. We work with the worker centers and community-based organizations to execute their service pro provide provision as well. And, and ultimately, even with as many hours that we have all been working to, to achieve these goals set out by the department, um, there are still countless workers, uh, especially in low income immigrant and black communities who are, are struggling to find access to these trainings, especially affordably. The truth is 
a lot of employers are not paying for this. That's a lot of how the industry is, is designed. Any workers that aren't getting provided this on right. job and by their employer are struggling to, to, to get these trainings and that means they'll be out of a job. So we urge uh, the extension. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Alba Villa followed by Annie Garneva. Your time will begin. Hi everyone, I'd like to thank everyone for the opportunity to be here with you all um, and for proposing this. NMCR has been around since 1982 and we've been committed to at expanding access to critical legal services and social services for communities of colors, particularly for immigrants. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can. <laughs> Sorry. Most of the people we serve are from low income workers from Caribbean and Latin America and increasingly from Africa <coughs> and the Middle East. In the almost 40 years since our founding, NMCR has always provided a holistic approach to service delivery. So when our immigrants, um, our immigrant clients came um, to our office for services, many of them were day laborers. They started coming to us with reports of employer abuse, workplace justice injuries, deaths in their families, wage theft and discrimination. <coughs> and we knew how to respond. Uh, about three years ago, with, uh, in large part due to funding from the Day Labor Workforce Initiative, NMCR opened the first Day Labor Center in Manhattan as part of the DLWI coalition. Now we're a fully operating worker center with a physical space for workers to meet an effective hiring hall, a cadre of organizers, teachers and lawyers committed to dispatching to training workers fighting wage theft and abuse by negotiating fair contracts with employers and building our local economy. <coughs> I'm proud to be part of the DLWI coalition and all the employers and building our local economy. And I'm proud um, of how far we've come. While NMCR was not included in the initial SST funding pool, we have been conducting SST training in Spanish to hundreds of workers a year and have a list of hundreds of workers on a wait list who desperately need access to training. Through our work, we've been able to gain a glimpse of what transformational change can look like and why we need that change to eliminate disparities within our communities. And we've demonstrated that workers centers in particular can move the needle in the right direction. One, so that we're not simply just sewing wounds and putting band-aids, but really weaving Time. justice into our social fabric. Before COVID-19, NMCR typically served 8,000 families a year through one-on-one -on -one legal consultations, worker center services, and educational programs. And during the pandemic, we've gotten as much as 4,000 calls in, a, in one um, month in terms of calls for help. So it's exposed many of our systematic failures in, in our country and in our city and the disparity that exists with communities of color. Um, <coughs> I was also appointed to Mayor Bill de Blasio's Labor and Workforce Sector Advisory Council and in discussing alongside fellow leaders how to rebuild a fair post-COVID-19 city, one thing was clear and that the only way forward is to put worker centers at the forefront of leading that effort. So as New York City continues to reopen and we reflect on how we can address the disparate impact of COVID-19 on communities of colors, we cannot deepen the levels of despair by failing to extend SST compliance deadline properly and funding a grassroots organization that serve frontline workers who have worked long hours under grueling and dangerous circumstances to help rebuild their city. NMCR has met the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic by rapidly adapting programs to meet the needs of our clients and the communities that we serve. We never run a pantry, we don't have funds for food, and yet with support of the community, we find a way to each week distribute 200 meals and grocery boxes. We stayed open like all the other worker centers, continued dispatching, distributed PPE to workers, ran worker meetings and distributed more than 800,000 in cash assistance. In mid-March, we had a list of 965 workers registered on a waiting list for SST. And that doesn't take into account the thousands of calls that our worker center has received in the last five months seeking access to training. NFCR's worker center supports a bill extending the SST compliance deadline and respectfully requests that as only Manhattan worker center, we have access to the funds to train the hundreds of workers that are desperately waiting for a chance to rebuild their lives and help us rebuild the city. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. I hope you submitted um, your testimony in writing, correct? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll next hear from Annie Garneva, followed by Blanca Palmeque. Your time will begin now. Hello. 
Good afternoon, and thank you, Chairman Carnegie and members of the council for giving members of the public the chance to testify on this critical issue, especially during this time of heightened public health and economic challenges. My name is Annie Garniva, and I'm the Director of Communications and Member Services of the New York City Employment and Training Coalition. The coalition supports the workforce development community to ensure that every New Yorker has access to the skills, training, and education needed to thrive in the local economy, and that every business is able to maintain a highly skilled workforce. Today, the coalition is here to give voice to the shared concerns of some of the city's nonprofit workforce development providers that make up our membership, particularly those that are supporting historically marginalized New Yorkers to access opportunities within the construction sector. These include members Building Skills New York, the HOPE Program, the Osborne Association, Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow, and STRIVE, some of which you'll be hearing from later today. Today, we're voicing our support for this bill an extension of the full compliance date for Local Law 196 from September 1st, 2020 to March 1st, 2021. We believe this extension is necessary to both ensure the spirit of the law, which is to establish stronger safety requirements and skills among New York City's construction workforce, and to make sure that economic hardships created by the ongoing pandemic are not exacerbated through this regulation. The three month shutdown that took place due to COVID impacted all industries tremendously, and especially face-to-face -face industries such as the construction sector. This in turn has meant that job losses have been hardest hit, hardest felt among low wage workers, people of color, immigrants, young workers, and less educated workers, all of whom were already facing outsized inequities in historic and systemic marginalization and disinvestment prior to the pandemic. And though the construction sector is beginning to rebound, it's a drop in the bucket relative to pre-COVID levels. As of June, um, the construction sector is still experiencing a 20% decline in overall jobs. Again, I emphasize that marginalized communities are faced and continue to face the highest rate of, rate of displacement. Most relevant to the proposed bill I'm being discussed today, um, just one last point and then I will submit my uh, piece in writing, is that part of the disparity is faced due to the digital disconnections that we've talked about today. And among our membership, we find about a 13% um, digital disconnection rate amongst clients and amongst smaller programs, such as the ones that I mentioned earlier, that goes up to 36%. So there are a lot of people that are not being captured into the data um, that was previously referenced uh, and that would really help uh, get those people um, laptops, uh, online, Wi-Fi access in, beyond just uh, having accessibility to the extension of the deadline. Uh, thank you and I look forward to listening to the rest of the testimony. Thanks, Annie. We'll now hear from Blanco Palomeque fo followed by Charlene Obernauer. Ok, buenas tardes. Este, mi primer idioma es el, el español, entonces eh, espero que alguien me pueda a, ayudar a traducir o, o voy a empezar. Estoy aquí representando a la cooperativa de, de entrenadores de salud y seguridad OSHA Solutions y yo vengo a, eh, hoy testifico en apoyo a la extensión del plazo de capacitación de la tarjeta SST, porque esto evitaría que muchos trabajadores, especialmente de la comunidad latina, quedarían sin empleo. Eh, muchos de ellos también ya están pasando lo que es esto de la pandemia, entonces están más vulnerables y por eso es que yo eh, estoy acá para decirles que si eh, fueran, pues, eh, eh, pudieran ustedes eh, de, a, a tener esa importancia de lo que es la, el, la extensión de la OSHA, de, perdón, de la tarjeta SST. Eh, gracias por eh, a, atenderme y espero pues que consideren esta extensión. Muchas gracias. Thank you. We'll now hear from Charlene Obernauer, followed by Daniel Castro. Your time will begin. Hi, my name is Charlene Obernauer. I'm the executive director of NICOSH, the New York Committee for Occupational Safety and Health. And we were one of the advocates behind Local Law 196. We strongly believe that training reduces the number of injuries and fatalities that workers experience on the job. And we strongly believe that Local Law 196 is essential for keeping New Yorkers safe. I wanna thank the uh, committee for having me here today. I wanna thank Carlos Manchaca, Council Member Carlos Manchaca, as well as the public advocate, Jumani Williams for their advocacy on this issue. And we support extending the deadline. The reason why we uh, support it isn't because, um, you know, we just want 
the deadline to be extended into infinity, but because realistically, the pandemic made it impossible for us to train workers. We typically train 15,000 workers in any given year. Um, and all of those trainings that we had planned were delayed after March 13th, when we no longer could uh, do in-person trainings. Now we've started to do online trainings. We actually have our first SST online training happening tomorrow. Um, but as you can see, it's been four months since we were able to really start up online. Um, also, there are workers who are not going to be able to have the necessary technology or skill set to be able to take the training online. So that provides another reason for extending the deadline. Overall, we think that workers need to be able to access the training in order for this deadline to be extended. So we're in support of all of the day laborers who have been um, all of the day labor organizations who've been given funding to provide trainings for uh, marginalized communities. And we think it's essential that these communities continue to have funding to be trained because the training itself is important and the only way that workers are going to get trained is if the communities themselves are able to offer those trainings. So thank you so much. In conclusion, Charlene at NICOSH, we support extending the deadline. Thank you. Thanks, Charlene. We'll now hear from Daniel Castro, followed by David Mead. Daniel. Your time hey. will begin. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today uh, before the council. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I work as an employment specialist with the whole program. Um, we serve members of low-income communities and at-risk youth and individuals who come in contact with the criminal justice system in uh, the Bronx and all five boroughs. Um, and, you know, as the city has been impacted by COVID shutdowns and service, cha service changes, many job training services like ours have had to pivot to uh, more virtual and remote um, trainings. And this has uh, presented a, a, a new um, set of, of check, technical challenges to, to navigate. Um, as you know, uh, from, from a ground worker's perspective, many of the New Yorkers we work with don't have adequate access to internet um, uh, tech, tech, you know, so um, phones, laptops, um, and, and digital literacy skills required to join these, um, these, these virtual trainings sometimes. So uh, we've really been working tirelessly to do um, outreach to, to our, our community to get them connected to these trainings. Um, and just doing a little more handholding to make sure that uh, folks are, um, you know, when, once they're able to join the trainings that they're able to complete um, and get connected to, to work. So um, we are totally in support of the deadline extension or allow us more time to get our workers trained adequately. And uh, that's it. Thank you for your time. Daniel. Next up is David Mead, followed by Lethia Guelpa. Your time will begin. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Dave Mead. I'm the executive director of Building Skills New York. We're a nonprofit construction uh, workforce development organization. We connect underemployed uh, New Yorkers to construction jobs throughout New York City. Uh, we're working with and work with prospective participants in underemployed communities to connect them with job opportunities and training. Um, to that end, we're proud that all of the building skills participants uh, we work with are both New York City residents and nearly 100% are men and women of color. Um, as New York continues on the path to economic recovery, construction industry is going to be at the heart of citywide effort, efforts to generate and sustain good, safe jobs for thousands of local residents. Uh, as you know, COVID-19 shut down most activities in New York City for approximately three months. And such shutdowns have made it difficult for workers to obtain the additional 10 hours of site safety training required for all construction workers by September 1st uh, under Local Law 196. And even now, the vast majority of them may still have difficulty obtaining the necessary training uh, since many courses are still online only and many workers may lack the technology to meaningfully access the internet. We estimate that uh, about the 800 people that we've accepted into our, our construction workforce program this year um, really less than 10% have the additional 10 hours of site safety training that are going to be required to uh, gain and maintain a construction job by September 1st. And uh, we think similar impacts are being felt, as you've heard earlier, by other workforce development organizations across the city. Uh, and as a leader of workforce development group that works with the underserved, uh, I think seeking pathways out of poverty, we know this is an outcome we cannot afford. I think at a moment like this, it's important to remember that, you know, city officials have previously extended deadlines related to Local Law 196 in order to access ca such cases as this. Uh, since it's widely understood that reaching the deadline without adequate training resources in place would end up leaving thousands of construction workers uh, jobless. So we, we strongly urge uh, you to extend the current September 1 deadline. 
you know, their meaningful extension is going to allow uh, organizations the ability to work with individuals who are still seeking their certification. And uh, again, your action on the issue is going to enable New York's uh, economic recovery, moving and protect the jobs of thousands of construction workers who deserve support during this difficult time. Thank you for uh, allowing me to provide comments today. Thanks, David. Next, we'll hear from Ligia Guapa, followed by Oswaldo Mendoza with translation by Manuel Castro. The time will begin. Hi. Um... Just one moment. Can you hear me now? Yeah, sorry. So my name is Ligia Walpa uh, from the Worker Justice Project, um, a, um, a essential organization that has been in the front lines providing safety training to day laborers and um, immigrant construction workers in New York City. Since the implementation of Local Law 196, we have continuously expressed our concerns about New York City's capacity to train a large growing immigrant workforce under a online based model. Despite many attempts to train the entire workforce, New York City has not managed to train all workers in the industry because of the lack of training and infrastructure. The pandemic has not only impacted the lives of workers, but has created the inability for many to get access to training and job opportunities. To get a sense of this reality and the importance of this extension, I'm just gonna let briefly, less than a minute, um, actually one of our members speak, Sergio Acce. Muy buenas tardes, mi nombre es Sergio Axche, soy de Guatemala y miembro del proyecto de justicia laboral y estoy acá hoy día eh, abocando para que se extienda la ley 196 para que nuestra gente, nuestra comunidad se entrene, nuestra comunidad se capacite. Como ven, COVID-19 hizo un daño grande a muchos en su economía y muchos no tienen acceso a internet para poder también entrenarse en línea y muchos también ahora que han perdido sus trabajos en restaurantes andan buscando medios para poder capacitarse para poder sobrevivir y querer in e involucrarse en lo que es la construcción ellos no tienen el medio ahora y están como en la nada pues esperamos que nos ayuden y se los agradecería de parte de mi comunidad gracias As Sergio explained, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges Sergio just explained is that many many workers have not been able to work. Therefore, many don't have the technology nor the resources to get trained online. And this is one of the reasons we're asking for the extension of Local Lot 196 and the ability to host a small online site, um, a small SST classes on site. Um, we hope to count with your support. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lydia. We'll now hear from Oswaldo Mendoza with translation by Manuel Castro, followed by Sean Brennan. Good afternoon, hey. everyone. Um, my name is Manuel Castro. I'm going to be interpreting for Oswaldo Mendoza, a member of uh, the organization. I uh, just want to introduce uh, ourselves real quick. I'm the executive director of the organization. We are a day labor center located in Jackson Heights, Queens. Uh, and so for the past uh, 20 years, we have been working very closely with day laborers and immigrant workers, mostly recently arrived uh, immigrants in, in New York City. And we've never faced the kind of challenges that we're facing right now. So many of our community members were directly impacted by this pandemic. Many unfortunately have died and have been sick. Uh, and so we've been working, uh, as Alva mentioned earlier, to support our communities. But recently we held a vigil uh, uh, to remember the worker, the Mexican immigrant worker who died uh, soon after the industry opened uh, a few weeks ago at a construction site. And with us, several family members or workers who had previously died came with us. And so it's clear that uh, we'll have to pay attention at construction, health and safety. Uh, and I don't think any anyone else wants uh, training and safety for our members or for this community more than we do. It's our community has the largest uh, uh, rates of death and injury in construction sites, but we gotta get this right. Uh, often uh, the lack of these uh, cards, these, uh, whether it's SST or OSHA, is used by employers as a way to lower wages, uh, as a way to uh, push them further down into the shadows and as a way to leverage their power over them. 
So we got to get this right. And for that reason, we support the extension. So right now, Osvaldo uh, Mendoza, who has been a longtime member of the organization, uh, will uh, share a few words with us. Osvaldo. Eh, gracias, Manuel. Bueno, eh, como ya Manuel lo dijo, mi nombre es Osvaldo Mendoza. Yo soy miembro de NICE ya hace muchos años y entrenador certificado por OSHA. Actualmente estamos proporcionando cursos de manera virtual entre semana y en fines de semana debido a la alta demanda de miembros de la comunidad. En, en este caso, los jornaleros que trabajan en la industria de la construcción. Más sin embargo, no es suficiente. Sabemos de primera mano los mismos trabajadores a los que entrenamos de las necesidades a las que se enfrentan todos los días, como por ejemplo, la falta de entrenamientos en seguridad y salud a bajo costo, ya que debido a la fecha tan próxima, los precios se han disparado y por lo mismo están siendo víctimas de abusos y en muchas ocasiones de fraudes, tarjetas falsas. Eh, otra, otro fraude o otro, otra exposición de estos trabajadores es cuando varios o muchos trabajadores están tomando las clases de forma presencial sin los protocolos adecuados, digamos la distancia social. Organizaciones como NICE actualmente estamos dando el entrenamiento de SST 10 horas, pero recordemos que son más de 60 mil trabajadores a los que debemos entrenar y no solo el número es un impedimento, sino el nuevo mundo al que nos estamos enfrentando debido a esta pandemia. Cabe mencionar que para muchas de estas personas, gente de nuestra comunidad que trabaja en la construcción, una industria de trabajo físico, trabajo con las manos, eh, hemos encontrado muchos casos donde nunca habían tenido interacción con una computadora. Así que esto se convierte en un doble reto, un doble esfuerzo, ya que se les tiene que introducir a esta tecnología nueva para ellos. Así que hoy estoy aquí en nombre de todos mis hermanos, de todos mis compañeros, pidiendo no solo se amplíe esta fecha límite, sino se provean más fondos para poder cumplir con el cometido y de esta forma ayudar a los trabajadores de la construcción a llevar el sustento a sus casas en tiempos tan difíciles. Muchas gracias por el espacio y la oportunidad. And I'll provide a quick summary. My name is Olvaso Osvaldo Mendoza. I'm a member of NICE. I'm also a certified OSHA instructor. Uh, at the organization at NICE, we provide uh, uh, OSHA training or as, as SST training day in and day out, you know, seven days a week, every day. We have been trained, but this is not enough. The demand because of the upcoming deadline is, is incredibly high. And you know, in large part because employers are not providing these trainings for workers, they depend on organizations like like Nice, where able to provide uh, the training free of cost. We also have seen a uh, increase in the prices of these trainings by private providers, and unfortunately, we're starting to see uh, fraud, uh, the, the selling of these uh, false, uh, fake cards on the street because of the of the upcoming deadline. Our organization is doing everything possible to provide training for thousands of workers, but the, the world has changed due to the pandemic. Unfortunately, we now have to do all the trainings online, uh, but as, as you probably know, a lot of these workers spend most of their days at day labor stops or at their construction sites, and they don't spend time in front of the computer uh, or understand the, you know, how to interact with the computer. So, so there's double the challenge now, not only having to provide access to this training, but also with computer literacy. So that's why I'm here uh, you know, to represent my brothers and sisters in the construction industry and my colleagues at NICE to ask for an extension of the SST deadline so that we can meet our goals and truly support the workers in, in this industry. Thank you so much. Thank you. We will now hear from Sean Brennan followed by Tamina Brohi. Your time will begin. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Sean Brennan. I'm the training director for Mason Tenders Training Fund. I also serve as an appointed member of the Site Safety Training Task Force convened in accordance with Local Law 196. Today, however, I come before the committee representing the Building and Construction Trades Council of Greater New York as chairman of its Health and Safety Committee. A year ago, no one could have predicted this pandemic or the catastrophic effect that COVID-19 would have on our nation. 
New York City in particular has been severely impacted by the health and economic consequences that this crisis has borne on us all. Vibrant industries, including the construction industry, were brought to their knees as the city unfortunately, but wisely, paused and sheltered in place to reduce the spread of the disease and curtail the virus impact. The pause eliminated for a significant period of time any in-person gatherings of more than just a handful of people. As a result, the construction industry's training providers across the city shuttered their doors and searched for answers that might permit training to continue in new ways. Some found a workable solution in the growing field of video conferencing platforms like the very one we're using for this hearing today. While certainly practicable, these virtual programs do not, however, present a seamless transition from our traditional training methods. A certain level of technical expertise is required for both the provider and the end user for the platform to function in an acceptable way for training purposes. Even those of us who have incorporated virtual training into our programs needed weeks to train our instructional staff in its use. With essentially all staff working from home, new ways to administer these programs and to keep necessary, keep records necessary uh, needed to be de developed. And all of this needed to be reach a standard that would meet the Department of Buildings approval. And then there's the cost. In order to provide this service, our program at the Mason Tenders has already spent in excess of $10,000. And if we continue to use it, we'll have a recurring annual cost of and exceeding $12,000. Time's up. I believe these issues, particularly the cost, cause a number of the training providers in the city to resist impl implementing this technology. Capacity has always been the guiding metric to use uh, to, to determine the suitable compliance state regarding local law 196. In June, three months into the pandemic, a full two thirds of the uh, approved providers were not providing online training. In fact, to this day, more than half of the city's providers have either elected to forego visual instruction or virtual instruction altogether, or have failed to meet satisfactory standard for DOB approval. Failure to recognize the critical impact this pandemic's imposed on the city's construction workers' ability to complete their training would be devastating. If the September 1st compliance date is not deferred to a later date, thousands and thousands of workers will be forced out of work at a time when employment is necessary, is absolutely essential to keep working families housed and fed. This simply cannot be allowed to happen to New York's hardworking men and women in construction. Therefore, on behalf of Gary LaBarbera and the Building and Construction Trades Council of Greater New York, I wholeheartedly support this amendment to move the final compliance date for Local Law 196 to March 1st, 2021. Thank you, and I'll happily answer any questions. Thank you. We'll now hear from Tamina Brohi, followed by Justinia Mata. Hello, folks. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, great. Your time will begin now. Uh, um, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in favor of extension. You're, you're breaking up oh. a little bit. Sorry. Good afternoon, folks. Thank you. Is that, is that better? Hello? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Tamina. I'm the Worker Cooperative Program Manager at Urban Upbound. And Urban Upbound is a community-based organization dedicated to breaking cycles of poverty for New York City public housing residents and other low-income New Yorkers. To that end, we incubate worker-owned businesses to provide job security and generate wealth. Two of the cooperative businesses that we closely support um, our OSHA solutions, and we witnessed firsthand the economic impact of COVID-19 on the businesses and on construction industry workers. Many community worker community members who work in the con construction industry are threatened with imminent job losses if they are unable to complete the additional training required, and trainers are holding smaller than normal classes due to social distancing guideline and need more time to finish to implement the trainings. Therefore, I'm testifying today in support of extending the SST deadline, at which will prevent job losses for thousands of construction workers across the city, many already in tough financial situations due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that there has been a precedent of extending training deadlines in the, training deadlines in the past in order to prevent massive job, job losses 
and we hope that the council and the committee will earnestly consider the importance of extending this deadline in this very unique situation we find ourselves in in the city in a global pandemic. Thank you for your time and we'll submit a written, written testimony as well. I hear from Yesenia Mata. Good time, we'll begin. When the pandemic hit, it was organizations that form part of day labor workforce initiatives that kept its doors open to ensure that workers were being protected. La Colmena, which is based on Staten Island, has, and it is still the only immigrant rights day labor organization open on site. Uh, we currently have our office flooded with phone calls from workers asking what is going on with the site safety training and some even still waiting for their SSD card. Uh, some are getting impatient and are upset too. So imagine currently who is the one that's getting the backlash, right? It's, it, it's me, it's my organization, it, despite having no control over this situation. Um, while we are in agreement with the extension, uh, this also gives us the opportunity to now have the conversation of what can be done by SBS to provide assistance. Uh, it is easy to say that there will be an extension. However, with no protocols or assistance in place, an extension means nothing. Uh, La Colmena currently hosts OSHA trainings at a nearby church and the church has a huge space. But despite having a huge space, we can only host about 15 or 20 workers. Plus we are the ones that need to pay for deep cleaning afterwards. Uh, obviously, there can be a blended program where we can host half virtually and half on site. However, we need guidance because right now La Colmena had to figure it out on their own on how to continue providing OSHA trainings on site. And we can't foresee what the future holds uh, with this pandemic, but we can put protocols in now in place to ensure that we are prepared. Uh, the day labor organizations, um, uh, just like mine, are trained and can provide that training that is necessary for workers to be safe on the job. But we also need assistance in ensuring that all workers are connected to resources and the necessary tools. Uh, an extension allows us to plan ahead and give the space in case it needs to be amended. And La Colmena is looking forward to working with everyone here to ensure that we can provide protection to all workers, especially during these hard times. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes our public testimony. If we've inadvertently forgotten to call on someone to testify, if you could raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function, we'll hear from you now. All right, seeing no one, uh, we'll turn it over to Chair Cornegie to close the hearing. Again, I wanna thank you so much uh, for this hearing. I think it's important that we, uh, even during a pandemic, put safety as a priority and this committee has committed to do that. I wanna thank the bill's sponsors again. Um, and uh, I wanna thank everybody who was able to testify here today. Hearing your voices is quintessential in making sure that we move forward as a more safe and more productive city and, and hold the industry accountable for making sure workers uh, are safe. Um, with that, this hearing of um, August 18th, 2020,